tonight's program, we have our little donation jar here. The museum offers mostly free and low cost programming to our community and any donations that you do give help us to keep those programs free and low cost and to make them as accessible and as and engaging as possible. And we really appreciate that support. I hope this on that good. note, let me tell you a little bit about the barter. I have a feeling most everyone, at least in this room, knows about the barter, but some of you on Zoom may not. The Barter Theater opened its doors proclaiming, with vegetables you cannot sell, you can buy a good laugh. The price of admission was 40 cents or an equivalent amount of produce. Four out of five theater, theater goers paid their way with vegetables, dairy products, and livestock. To the surprise of many, all the seats for the first show were filled. The concept of trading ham for Hamlet caught on quickly. At the end of the first season, the barter company cleared $4.35 in cash, two barrels of jelly, and a collective weight gain of over 300 pounds. <laughs> Today, at least one performance a year celebrates that history by accepting donations for Feeding America Southwest Virginia. Barter days happen in the month of June as a birthday celebration for the Barter Theater. As the State Theater of Virginia, the Barter Theater is the nation's longest running professional theater and it's received countless awards and accolades throughout its history. And it has also been a launching pad for the careers of many iconic actors and actresses. We are very fortunate to have, oops, we are very fortunate to have the Barter in our area. They produce so many wonderful plays and so many wonderful things both for children and adults, and they do a lot of educational programming too. So we are very fortunate to have them here. So be sure and check out this play afterwards. But tonight we're fortunate to have them here to give us a sneak peek sort of behind the curtain um, with the cast and collaborators who are part of Keep on the Sunny Side production. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to director Nick Piper to do the introductions and kick off their program. I think I, think I take care of awesome. it. Awesome. Okay. Right. Upcoming production of Keep on the Sunny Side, which we're in rehearsals for right now. We're about midway through our process. We've been having a lot of fun um, uh, putting it together. Uh, we're excited to be here tonight to be able to um, share some of our experiences about this play. Uh, this is a play that for many of us on this stage, most of us, um, we've been associated with for a very long time. Uh, and it's impacted us in, in different ways. And we're going to get into a little bit um, that tonight. In fact, um, this play was read in our very first Appalachian Festival of Plays and Playwrights in 2001, which is our new play uh, festival dedicated to celebrating Appalachian culture. And um, in a lot of ways, this play has become kind of the, um, the, the standard for that and, and what we're really trying to do with that festival. So, uh, um, We'll spend some time tonight uh, telling some stories and singing some songs. And, uh, and then, yes, right afterwards, we'll be happy to take any questions that, uh, that you might have. Um, hey, Scott, is it possible to get a little more light up on here? I'm just, I'm blind now because I'm old. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so let me let me introduce who we'll be talking with tonight. First of all, uh, let me introduce our playwright. This is Doug Pote. Um, Doug was a uh, was a family doctor who has lived and practiced medicine in Southwest Virginia since 1982. Um, aside from being the the playwright, this play he's written two other um, biographical musicals that we produced at Barter. Uh, one, Man of Constant Sorrow, the story of the Stanley Brothers. And, um, and also America's Blue, uh, Blue Yodeler, which is the story of Jimmy Rogers. Please welcome Doug Pote, our playwright. We'll be talking with Eugene Wolfe, who, uh, who originated the role of A.P. Carter in, uh, in 2002 and has played it a number of times since. Um, in a lot of ways, it's actually become his signature role mm -hmm. and has led to uh, many different opportunities and experiences and relationships. Um, and Eugene is also the music director of the show. He helped, he puts together the whole sound, the vocal sound, the music sound. Um, so we'll talk about that as well tonight. Uh, you may also recognize Eugene as one half of the Brother Boys, um, a band he and Ed founded in 1986. Um, and in fact, this year, the uh, Bear Family Records is put, putting out a box set of all your music. Is that right? That's right, yeah. How about uh, that? Compilation. 
This is Jill Anderson. Jill um, comes to us from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, she's playing Sarah Carter in the show. She's, you may have recognized her from other shows at Barter. Um, you've seen her in Bright Star, uh, Full Monty. Mm -hmm. We did a perfect murder, a British thriller yeah. murder comedy. Yeah. So, uh, but but uh, Jill is a, uh, Jill also played the role in 2008 when we did it. The last the last time we did it at Barter's uh, Gillum stage. So, uh, welcome, Jill Anderson. <laughs> Uh, just, you're very excited to have Brandy Hart. Brandy uh, is a longtime uh, musician and performer. Um, if any of you all remember the Dixie Beeliners, uh, uh, Brandy's played with them for a long time. She comes to us from Lexington, Kentucky. Brandy Hart. Yeah. So, let's, um, let's start with you. Uh, let's start with um, kind of the Keep on the Sunny Side origin story, which is... Uh, uh, when you decided to write this, I, I love this. Um, I love this story just because it's a great example of um, an idea being turned into a reality, which has brought so much joy to a lot of people. So, talk about your first experience, like that, in the oh, lobby yeah. of the Carter Theater. Yeah, uh, you all here. You want to know how a guy from Massachusetts who knew nothing about Appalachian music could write this play? <laughs> Well, first of all, let me just tell you that I don't like writing. I'm a math and science guy, basically, but I love music. And I used to think of myself as a amateur music historian. So um, along the way, I kind of discovered the Carter family, uh, mainly beginning with uh, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band's uh, landmark album in 1971, Will the Circle Be Unbroken, that Maybell Carter performed on. And I noticed a lot of the songs were written by A.P. Carter. And then I bought Emmy Lou Harris's Greatest Hits album, and she had that song, Hello Stranger, again, written by A.P. Carter. So I'm thinking, well, who's this A.P. Carter dude? Well, then, when I moved to Southwest Virginia in 1982, um, you know, and I found out the Carters from, were from around here, I'm like, hey, man, this is, this is awesome. So I went up to the Carter Fold, learned a little bit more, but I wanted to learn the Carter family songs. And back then, you know, you could not, there was only one CD that had Carter family <coughs> original songs on it. You know, you really couldn't buy the records. Um, and so I used, I learned their songs by other people doing them. And so for about five years, I mean, I was just eat up with the Carter family combing the record stores, what, what used to be called a record store, <laughs> um, looking for songs that were uh, written by A.P. Carter that were Carter family songs. And I just learned a tremendous amount of songs that way. Um, and actually, in, somewhere in the early 90s, I wrote a radio program about the Carters playing with other people playing their songs that was done on uh, WMEV in Mary, about a two-hour program. So I had my office in Bristol at that time, and about that time, Fred McClellan, Leighton Harding, Tim White started the BCMA. And I can still remember opening the Bristol paper, looking at their picture standing in front of Tim's mural. BCMA, yes, that, that is the, that's the organization for me. So I joined that organization, and we used to have our meetings on the stage of the Paramount Theater in Bristol. Well, one time, Rick Rose came to a meeting, and he said that the barter would like to do plays based on the area's musical heritage. Well, you know what I thought. Carter family. <laughs> and so I thought, hmm, that would be a great play if I could just find someone to write it. <laughs> Me not being a writer. <laughs> so... I carried that idea in my head for about six years, and my wife and I in 2001 went to the barter to see Smoke on the Mountains. And we saw Rick out in the lobby. And I said, do you ever think about doing a play about the Carter family? And he said, oh yes, we would love to do that. That would be awesome. I mean, we're, yeah, it's great. So I said, well, look, I'm not a writer, but I do know a lot about the Carter family. So if you ever get around to doing it, I think I could help you. So I went home and I thought, hmm, maybe if I wrote an outline, that would get them started. Then I thought, well, you know, I do know how these, scene, these couple of these scenes should go. So I wrote four <laughs> scenes with the outline, sent it to the barter, 
And they wrote back and they said, we love it. We want you to finish it. <laughs> well, about that time, uh, I got a call from the buyer and said, your play has been selected for the Appalachian Festival of Plays and Playwrights. I was like, hey, that is awesome. I guess you know I haven't written it yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, th we thought you had written it. Like, well, I will. Don't worry. <laughs> now, when you're not a writer and you haven't written the play and it's accepted for the Appalachian Festival of Play and Playwrights, you know you've got a really good idea. <laughs> So, uh, Keep on the Sunny Side was, uh, I always say it's the first play read. The, you, you think it was? I might have been. Yep. Okay, let's go with it. Sure. First play read. The first play, read, the first yeah, play yeah. ever yeah. read on the first <laughs> Appalachian <laughs> Festival of Plays and Playwrights. And I had written the script, and before the reading, of course, you know, it's a, it's a reading at the Appalachian Festival of Playwrights. Professional actors, no sets, no, no right. costumes or anything. But before a live audience. So you really get to see how the play, you know, might play. Um, before, before the reading, I read the whole script with my uh, sister-in-law. She read the female parts, I read the male parts. We didn't crack a smile. Because I mean, this is serious stuff. I love the Carter family. I want you to love the Carter family. <laughs> well, when we got to the reading, the guy, it wasn't Eugene that played, uh, that did the reading with Mm -hmm. did they feel it was Mike Ostrowski. Yeah. Now, Mike is a guy, I don't know if you remember him from Barter, but, you know, very nice guy, great actor. Always a little bit of a grin on his face. <laughs> and, I mean, he found a lot of humor in that, you know, in that thing. And, I mean, people were just laughing, raw, and, and I got kind of paranoid. I'm like, well, do people think I'm making fun of the Carter family? <laughs> Well, when the thing was over, Rick Rose turns to me and says, well, you must be very proud of yourself. But, um, you know, I, I was worried that people thought this was a parody. So I talked to a lot of people and they said, no, 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 it was just funny. It was funny situations. And I thought, hmm. Well, you have to remember a play is not a documentary. That's right. It is not a lecture. It's entertainment. So how are we going to entertain? We're going to entertain with great music, humor, and a powerful story. So then they gave me a year to work on it. Uh, oh, by the way, um, at the Appalachian Festival of Plays and Playwrights, there's six plays that are read, and one is selected for a mini production the following year. Which that, no, no, yes, that was true back then. Yeah, I mean, I guess you'll have an opportunity to talk more. About <laughs> yeah, yeah. but I do remember that, that yeah. you have to keep on the sunny side. But anyway, uh, so keep on the sunny side was gonna have a mini production, uh, the following year, they gave me a year to work on it. Well, I always thought that the barter would say, well, this was good, that was bad, you know, throw that out, take this, you know, but they didn't. So I uh, gave me a year to work on it, and uh, finally we came up with a script. What did, you find, what did you find most challenging about it as, a, as, a, as somebody who'd never written a play? You're writing a play about, a, a, a biographical play about people and um real people who existed. Yeah. What did you find that, um, well, tell me about, about that, I find the balance between kind of what is historically accurate, but what, but also what is necessary to tell your story, to, to tell the story of the car. Yeah. Uh, well, what's one really good thing about writing a play compared to a book? In a book, if you've read a book, you've got to read, you've got to do the whole story. A play, you can only, you can only dramatize so many segments of the story. So you can do the parts of the story that you like. But obviously it's important to pick the key parts of the story. Right. Now I remember when I, at the reading, I had a scene you know, at, in Mexico, yep. you know, XERA. I also had a scene with Jimmy Rogers in Louisville. And I said, well, there's not room for both of those. One had to go. So fortunately for me, <laughs> I picked uh, you know, the yep. Mexico scene, which obviously is yep. a huge scene in the, in the play. So I think that's the thing. You've got to decide what you're going to do. And I'll tell you, as far as not writing it all those six years, my hang-up was, well, I can't write dialogue. Mm -hmm. But if you know your character, you know, dialogue's not that hard. You know, it's just conversation. Tennessee Williams disagreed with this. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say, let's just say no one's ever complained about her dialogue. <laughs> <Name dropper. laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, um, 
you know, you have to get into character. Well, I know how people from Southwest Virginia talk, <clears throat> country people, you know, fr from my wife's family. But I don't know how, how Southwest Virginia people talk in 1920, right. and neither do you. Right. But, you know, we had, to, we had to get a good balance between sounding country, but not sounding stupid. Right. You know, and matter of fact, um, Ricky Skaggs wrote a book. And I read it, and I, and I went to see him, and I talked to him after the, after the performance, and I said, I think you did, you know, the people of this area, you know, a big service through your use of dialogue in your book. And he said, well, it was difficult. Because, um, you know, the guy that was writing it with me, he wanted to make it sound more sophisticated. And I said, no, it's got to be the way people do talk. And so I think fortunately, you know, in the play, you know, no one has ever complained about the dialogue. Right. Matter of fact, last time we performed it in 2015 up at the Carter mm -hmm. Bowl, one of the people who's, you know, up there all the time, you know, said to me at uh, intermission, this seems so real. You know, that's a huge compliment. I, I think, I think one of, we could talk a little bit about this in rehearsal. I think one of, uh, to me, um, that is part of the power of, of theater is mm -hmm. that, we're not going to be telling every, because we don't know what was said between AP and Sarah in their first meeting. We're right. imagining something. Exactly. But when you invest in the characters and in the story that you're telling, um, the audience provides the rest, right? right. Like, um, and, and so I, this happened a lot of men with constant sorrow. People would say, oh my gosh, you sound just like Carter Stanley. I didn't sound anything like Carter Stanley. I wish I could sound like Carter Stanley. Yeah. Well, but, uh, but, you sound a lot more like him than you. Well, well but, but, however, but I just feel like once you kind of tell a story and we're all in here together listening to it, the audience fills in the rest and it becomes a part of it. Let me, let me ask you um, just real quick. What was your relationship with the Carter family before you did this show? Because one, um, of, the, because one of the, I think one of the, the great blessings of this show has been that we've developed a relationship with, with the Carter family. Yeah. Um, and it's been one that's been so... Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I didn't know them very, that well, but I did know them some. I had been up to the Carter Fold some. And, of course, when I wrote the radio program, I went and interviewed Jeanette Carter so I could play some of the interview on the radio. And uh, then, after, or just as I was finishing up the interview, Rita kind of shows up. And she's like, now, if anyone says anything bad about my grandfather on the mm -hmm. radio show, yeah. you know, <laughs> I said, hey, no, you know, we're not going to do that. About all we got time to cover is AP look for the songs. Sarah had a beautiful voice. Maybe I'll play guitar and we'll play the music. So then Rita and I kind of became friends, you yeah. know. <laughs> and I would submit <laughs> scripts to them. Jeanette at that time was a little bit too old to really read mm -hmm. a script. But Rita did, and she read several scripts for me, made some suggestions. So, you know, we got them involved right at the beginning. Yeah. I, Eugene, um, your relationships with the Carters, um, how, how, did, how, did, how do you think about your relationship with AP starting right, way back when we first started developing this and, and kind of what, how that's grown for you? Well, uh... Wait, 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 what was the Carter family as part of, part of your growing up? Well, part of my growing my grandmother loved the Carter family. And I thought, oh, Lord, uh, <laughs> them old songs. Mm -hmm. You know, I really did. You know, I was a kid. I, I went to Eastview Elementary. So, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in town. Um, <laughs> So anyway, Memo would Memo would hum them and sing and sing them, and I think you know they were lovely melodies, but I would just think, oh. Um, and then when then I heard somebody sing a Carter family song at the Down Hall mm -hmm. back in like uh, late seven or no early eighties, and I heard somebody sing, "You've been a friend to me," and suddenly the door something opened. It was like, what is this beautiful melody, these beautiful words, uh, like the, the language of uh, the, the language that reaches for something that, that, uh, that, that at the time pop music was not reaching for. <laughs> um, but, but at any rate, so then when I got cast as A.P. Carter, I thought, I'm going to probably have to learn how to play the guitar. 
because I had a guitar all my life, but didn't hardly touch it. Yeah. I, and so I thought, oh, well, Eugene, you're going to play A.P. Carter, at least learn how to play G, C, D. <laughs> um, so I did. I got ready. And um, but as we worked on the play, I started to understand how much of the Carter family music and the Carter family, for lack of a better term, ethos or whatever, was part of who I was through my grandparents, yes. through my grandmother. And then it made me think, where did my grandmother hear them? She grew up in Rabbit Hill, Tennessee. You know, she was born in 1911. So by the time the Carter family was on the radio, she was uh, 16, 17 years old. Did she have a radio? I mean, I never asked her these things. Right. And so I started to understand that they were the soundtrack to my childhood. So I began to... Uh, when we first did the show, that first night that we did it, Dale Jett came to see us as a scout because we understood that if the show wasn't up to par, that it would not happen for long because Jeanette Carter would go, uh, no. <laughs> um, so Dale, J Dale came. And so evidently on opening night, the entire family showed up. So evidently it was, went well. It went well. Um, and that first night, that opening night, the Carter family was sitting in the front, like this close, maybe even closer yeah, stage at two, stage yeah. two. And they were all lined up in that front row. And there's a scene where AP passes. And before he passes, he asks his daughter, Jeanette, to please carry on the music. And I started realizing I'm sitting directly in front of Jeanette Carter. And I'm going, to, I'm playing her father who's going to pass away. And indeed, as that scene unfolded, the entire family was bawling and they were holding each other's hands in a daisy chain. Mm. And it was like the most surreal thing I've ever done yep. on stage. So that sort of uh, sealed my relationship to the Carters. Yeah. And uh, one of the most supreme compliments I've ever had is, Jeanette told somebody, you know, that man that plays my daddy shakes dislike him. <laughs> she said, is there something wrong with him? <laughs> I've done my job. <laughs> okay, getting back to this scene that uh, Eugene was talking about. Like I said, I'd never written a play before. So, you know, when they, I thought I should go to the rehearsals, which I, yeah, which I did. Um, but there was a moment we're just in a big empty rehearsal hall. Eugene is sitting in a chair. The actress who plays Jeanette is next to him and they're doing that scene where she makes, where she makes the promise to her father and he passes on. And she is bawling her eyes out. She could not get through that scene without crying. And so I'm just sitting there and all of a sudden, I mean, I realized how powerful this was gonna be. And so I called up Rita, and I said, Rita, you better get ready. All I can tell you is I'll be there with you, and we'll have plenty of Kleenex. <laughs> yeah. And that's how it was. And, the, you know, we were there in the front row, and mm -hmm. Rita's here, and Jeanette's here. We'll pass, like you say, we'll pass some Kleenex back and forth. But, I mean, that is the power of live theater. Well, and this, and this show in particular has, been, has offered us so many um, different amazing uh, – experiences that I would have never imagined in my life. Like, like the first time we went up to the Carter Fold to do this was at this, uh, and during that uh, same time, or 2003 or four? 2003. 2003. Yeah. And back then it was, it was still, it was before the Fold had been renovated. It was all the bus seats and the stove and all this stuff. And, um, and I just remember we went up there and we rehearsed it that day. And then the night that we were performing it, I was standing out on the back, um, on the back deck that they used to have there. And as you look down the valley, it was getting dark. You saw just a line of headlights coming up the valley. Like, I don't know if you ever saw the end of Field of Dreams where, yes. where all they're, they're coming. And I was just like, I can't, I can't believe this. And it, it filled up an 800 seat house. And then, so then we're starting to do the show and there's Jeanette and the family right on the front. Um, at this point, when we were at the fold, they were like on the floor right next to us doing the thing. And I'm watching Jeanette watch Jeanette tell her father's story. And then 
at the end, towards the end of the show, when um, uh, I think it was Gold Watch and Chain, um, and and uh, the the lady was playing Sarah Carter was playing it, and Jeanette, I could see from where I was sitting, was just staring at her hands and saying she's playing. She played. So she said she played just like my mother, and so you know, just like these mm -hmm. just chills of being able to to what what um what what do you feel like. Uh, what does it feel like? Like you're, you're playing an icon from this region. Mm -hmm. Do you feel any like what? What? Did, how do you approach that? Well, you you only can play what you can. You know, you you decide you you love the person you're going to play. Yeah. And you learn about the, uh, as far as the iconography of him. Um, I love it. You know, I love being able to bring the soul of a P. To, to life because he, to me, he's, he's like a mystic to me. And so you just get inside him. And the, I love the music so much. And I love music so much that I understand. I understand what the why of what he did. But I've come to learn over the past 20 years just more and more about what he did for us. Mm -hmm. And not just us here in this region, but for America, really in American music and the way he like, you know, they talk about him being his mother almost being hit by lightning just before she when she was carrying him in her pregnancy. And so that he'd come out, shape, he'd come out nervous. Mm -hmm. And I think about that. She took him out of school when he was eight because everybody made fun of him. He I feel like that lightning tuned him, you know, and gave him the power and the curiosity and not just the curiosity, but the, 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 uh, the need to, he is the lightning. He struck the mountains and pulled the music out, yeah. you know, and gave it to us. And now we have a template. It's the template of American music, you know? And so, I, I can't think about those things when I'm playing, right. but it sure is nice to know that. Well, you know? I, think, I think that's one of the things that is played as well, or, or when you approach something like this, is that to play someone as an icon is very removed, it feels like. And it's mm -hmm. not, but what, what draws us in to something like this is when you get to learn about their humanity and, and what they, and I think that's one of the nice things about this play is people have an idea about the Carter family and then we get to see kind of what it, what their lives were like um, and how they relate to our own lives. So Jill, you, you're playing Sarah Carter, who's also iconic. How do you approach this? Thing? Well, I, the first time I played the role, I came to it not knowing about the Carter family. Mm -hmm. I knew Will the Circle Be Unbroken because who doesn't know that? Mm -hmm. you know, but then to come here to the very place where those people lived and to feel the nature, the nature of the region is like the first doorway right. into like they came out into these mountains every day to do their chores and they saw the the creeks and heard the birds and like I go out and get into nature as much as I can to feel the place itself but then Sarah like the Sarah person what an interesting woman like if he is the ether she is the earth like she's grounded she's practical um, she's concerned about family and um, sustenance mm -hmm. and his head's in the clouds, you mm -hmm. know, and it happened to not work because it right. put the burden of, of the unglamorous parts of life squarely on her shoulders. Yeah. And she w was having none of it. She didn't, she didn't want the burden of it. And I think uh, one line in this, I think is like my favorite line to describe the conundrum where she says, um, uh, he says, don't you like our music? She said, yeah, I like it. On the porch in the evening after the day's work's done. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. now with this music deal and all this traveling to New York and the chaos of, of doing public appearances and whatnot, that's not what she wanted. Yeah. Uh, she looked around and the other women in the community had families, they had stability, they had homes. And I think... From what I can gather from the research, that's what she wanted too. Something stable. Yeah. But this was just, a, it was a, a, she says it's a whirlwind. This, we've been thrown into a whirlwind and she didn't know how to balance all of it. Well, so the, Car it, the yeah. Carters almost thought about not going to Bristol because it was an arduous 
30 mile trip. <laughs> and they had three flat tires on the way. But later, after they got signed to record deals, they had to travel to Atlanta, Memphis, Charlotte, Camden, New Jersey, New York City. Can you imagine driving to those places? You know, in, in the, yeah. back in those days. We have imagined it in rehearsal with <laughs> AP just, just complaining and yelling at the people in the car. So <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. Oh, which, uh, uh, so, Brandy, Brandy uh, after your first eight days of rehearsal, uh, uh, <laughs> you're, approach, you're approaching the icon of Maybell. I know, I know Maybell certainly has influenced you as a, as a company performer. What, what, uh, what are you feeling in it? Like, and what's it like right now? Well, I'm sinking into the character mm -hmm. and doing a lot of research, which mm -hmm. is uh, super fun, just watching old interviews and really... Um, she was known to be um, rather mirthful, but also she had like a quiet part of her. So um, uh, and these piercing blue eyes that yeah. uh, were <laughs> everyone knew about. So I'm just really trying to do homework and really settle in. I mean, my gosh, I mean, just bowing down to the goddess that was Mother Mabel <laughs> Carter, you know, um, and grateful for the opportunity but she seemed to be a, a, in a lot of ways like a glue because when these two split she really was she was hanging on trying to make peace um and yeah. uh that's what i'm attempting to do in the play um and uh, obviously it's a huge honor to work alongside Eugene and Jill, um, but uh, man, and yeah, Andy. she's iconic. Along those lines, let me just say, you know, in case you don't know, Nick was part of the original cast mm -hmm. of on the Sunny Side. He what was called Man Number One, <laughs> which means he had multiple roles. <laughs> and then Gil Braswell, mm -hmm. if you remember him, he was man number two. Now, every time I came to rehearsal... I never let him forget that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> every, time, every time I came to rehearsal, man number one and man number two had bigger parts in the club. <laughs> so they're doing all this background music and all this kind of stuff, and I'm thinking, well, this is about the original Carter family, A.P. Sarah Maybell. <laughs> And man number one and man number two taking over the play. But really, it's, you know, it, it, it's a tribute to the talent of Nick and, of course, also Gil. And also, Nick was um, Carter Stanley in Man of Constant Sorrow. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he and did Gil a fabulous yep. job. <laughs> and, Car and Carter Stanley's daughter, Doris, who Ralph didn't get along with, <laughs> told Nick, while you were singing, I closed my eyes and I could see my father. Yeah, oh, that's very nice. Yeah. I, 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 I think that's so kind. I do attribute that, though, to the power of theater and all of us in a room together and uh, giving ourselves over to a story. That is just, that's, that's what does it. Well, let, let's look at Let me just tell one little and about Eugene. Of course, Eugene has been, every time Barter's done it, Eugene has been A.P. Carter. It's his signature role. Uh, other theaters have done Keep on the Sunny Side, and Rita Forrester and I sometimes would travel and, you know, see these other performances, which were good, very good performances. Um, but, you know, I'd always ask Rita, well, what do you think? Well, I got to play the AP. You wasn't as good as you did. <laughs> <laughs> I came to realize that AP himself <laughs> played himself in the play. He still would not be able to play. <laughs> so, let, let, let's sing a few songs. Let's, um, um, one, Doug, one of the I, I things I think you've done so well with this play is to um, is to find songs that tell this story and move the story forward. I mean, you must know every Carter family song by heart by now. Uh, no, but uh, I mean, but, well, seriously, they've done over two hundred over two hundred songs. I've heard them all, but I would say I know maybe eighty or a hundred. But I'll tell you this, wow. you know, some of you might know four or five Carter Family songs, 20, 30, 40, whatever. The more Carter Family songs you discover, the more beautiful, poetic songs you will find. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. AP had such an ear 
for poetic lyrics and beautiful melodies. Yes, indeed. Well, let's let's take a look at this first song. Uh, we're we're going to do a song here called Happy or Lonesome, which you put in their first meeting, uh, yeah. AP and Sarah. Um, AP comes by to try to sell Sarah fruit trees. Um, mm -hmm. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me just tell uh, the yeah, story, go ahead. The story that Jeanette, you know, of course, this is, a, this is one story Jeanette told over and over again. Obviously, it had to be a scene in the play. You know, when my father, when I, when my father met my mother, he was selling fruit trees. He traveled over Clinch Mountain. He came down on the North Face, and he heard a girl singing. Followed the voice, and peering through the trees, he saw Sarah for the first time. Hmm. The most beautiful girl he'd ever seen. The most beautiful voice he'd ever heard. So then we have to build yeah. know, a scene around that. And of course, they both loved music. So AP sings My Clinch Mountain Home to Sarah. And then he asks her, you know any songs? <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> Could you sing one for me? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Bristol Sessions mm -hmm. in 1927, in early August 1927, when Ralph Peer came to Bristol to find old songs. Um, Carter family came and they sang, they ended up recording six songs, I believe. Yeah, right? they recorded a total of six for the first day. Yep. And then two the second day. And here is one of the most amazing yet true parts of the story. After pushing his family into traveling the arduous 30-mile trip to Bristol to record for Mr. Peer, AP didn't even show up the second day. <laughs> was he he was fixing the, tire? the flat tire. You, know. you? you got to do what you got to do. Why? Well, yeah. yeah. So, got to get uh, home. Uh, and, who, and who are, who are some of the other uh, artists who were... Who were 
kind of commercial sessions? Uh, well, I mean, uh, the Stoneman family. Stoneman. And I mean, really, I think it's because they had already been to New York. They had recorded records. Mr. Peer knew them mm -hmm. that, you know, and the Stoneman suggested he come to Bristol. Um, and then, Jimmy of course, Rogers, right? yeah, big thing. Of course, the Carters recorded their first song on uh, August 1st <clears throat> and their second two songs, August 2nd. And then Jimmy Rogers, who obviously, you know, also is a huge person in the history of country music. He recorded his first songs August 4th. So that is why we think of Bristol as, you know, kind of the beginnings of commercial country music, the big bang of country music, whatever. I'm not sure exactly what here they're calling it here at the uh, museum these days, but, you know, I mean, it's basically like if Chuck Berry record in rock and roll, Chuck Berry recorded, let's just say, in Chicago, and then two days later, um, Elvis Presley recorded. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's just, yeah. you know, yeah. it's huge. Well, I, okay, well, and one of the songs they recorded uh, on those days was called Bury Me Under the Weeping Willow. The very the first one. The very first song they recorded? Yeah. <clears throat> months old and she was still nursing <laughs> and AP just based in from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> they should be some record. <laughs> Our player's pregnant, your lead singer's nursing and you just base in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, when we were touring this, we, we went all over and, and met so many different people who were connected to this music mm -hmm. and had very personal relationships with, I, I mean, no matter where, where, whether we were in Texas or, or up north or whatever, uh -huh. what, what do you think that's about? Why? Well, I, I think it's from, you know, they, in 1937, I think they went to Mexico to, to a broadcast from a 500,000 watt station. <laughs> now, 500,000. <laughs> yeah, in Mexico it is. Uh, but they, you, June, June Carter said you could hang a tin can on any fence post in Texas and hear the Carter family. Yeah. <laughs> but that's almost true up in Nova Scotia. In Alaska, Ivy Shepard tells a story about a young boy in the Yukon, like a young kid who asked them when they were touring, them, do you know any Carter family songs? So the reach, granted that boy wasn't alive then, but... Here's what happened, I think. What I, uh, what I read is that 
they were the voice of the depression in the country. You know, and they sang these very specific songs about heartache, about loss, about people going away to war, about lovers coming back, lovers gone, all the things that everybody in America was experiencing. But it didn't matter the culture that it came from. These were songs that the language is like Victorian, mm -hmm. you know, and so the language reached everybody. Somebody compared the Carter family. So everybody was responding to the same things that the Carter family was singing about. And they were experiencing them on the radio, which was the only outside thing that was coming to their houses during the depression. So that, those, the people who actually heard them, those songs are so important to them that they passed that importance down to their children, their grandchildren, whether the children and grandchildren actually know the songs or not, it doesn't matter. They've passed it through blood, you know? And so people today understand that my great grandmother loved the Carter family and there's a connection to that blood and to mm -hmm. that love that still lives. Because when we would travel around, like you said, people would say, you know, my grandmother, my, I have to tell a quick story yeah. about when we did it in stage two, one time I looked, I kept seeing over here in the uh, front row was a little woman, she was like, she was like 90 years old and she had her raincoat on and she had her little rain bonnet on still <laughs> and she had her pocketbook up close to her and thick cataract glasses. So I could see those eyes, you know. And anyway, I kept looking at her and she, I'm sure it's the first time she'd ever been to a theater. And she was watching this show about the Carter family. And nobody had ever done anything about the Carter. We hadn't seen a movie, we hadn't seen nothing about them. And as she was in just in wonder that the Carter family was standing right here, mm -hmm. you know? And also as I watched, I, I kept my eye on her kind of, and as the play progressed, she went from 90 to seven years old, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's the power. Yeah. That's the power of what these people gave to us, you know? Yeah. You, um, I said, let's do so, Blue Eyes next. Okay. Before we get okay, to that, okay. uh, since, since, since we were, um, you mentioned Mexico and, and uh -huh. that, uh, uh, one of the um, things that I, I remember about the development of this play was that um, while we were in rehearsals for it, um, uh, what's his name, Mark Swanitzer? Mark Swanitzer, yeah. Yeah, uh, this, this uh, person had released a book about the Carter family right in the middle while we were rehearsing it. So we all first were through it and, and, um, and there was one new fact that we had not known before. Yeah. And, uh, and, it was, and it was something that took place in, in Mexico. Why do you okay, yeah, as, you, as you guys probably know, uh, you know, AP and Sarah got divorced, um, and, but continued to work together. Um, mainly because Mr. Pierre's wife sent Sarah a letter <laughs> and explained to her that um, the mu music business is entertainment like the movies. And all those Hollywood stars are divorced or should be, and they <laughs> still work together. So, um, so they kept working together. Well, when I first wrote the play, Jeanette and Rita and everyone was saying, we don't know why AP and Sarah got divorced. They were just different, you know, couldn't work it out, whatever. So that's what was in the play. Well, then, you know, here we are. We've already had the reading. It's a year later. We're going into the mini production. The cast is here. And all of a sudden, Mark Swanich's book shows up. And of course, we're all reading it like crazy. Koi Bays, hey, what the? And so that's when we first learned about the um, affair with Koi Bays, which, who was AP's um, cousin. And, um, and then, of course, uh, you know, we learned how Sarah uh, reconnected with Koi through uh, musically. Uh, as uh, I guess, let me just back up and say, um, Sarah and AP, uh, Sarah and Coy had an affair. AP found out about it. He had a little talk with Coy and his father. Hmm. I don't know exactly what AP said, but I believe something about the size of the valley did come up in that talk. 
And at any rate, and this is the other thing that's just unbelievable about this whole story, it actually happened. Coy, his mother, his father, his siblings, packed all their possessions into two automobiles and headed down the rutted roads of Four Valley, heading west into the teeth of the Depression, eventually reaching California. And June Carter Cash writes about this. She was just a small girl. She writes about it in her book. She can still remember those two automobiles, you know, heading down the road. So Sarah, at that point, you know, AK and Sarah split up. She moved back across the mountain to Aunt Nick's. And, um, but AP and Sarah kept working together. And then of course they went down to Mexico to be on the 500,000 watt station. Sarah didn't know where Coy was, but one, one uh, time she decided that perhaps a live coast to coast radio show might be the way to find out. Right, so she, so she dedicated a song mm -hmm. to Coy Bates, right? Yeah. Go ahead and dedicate it. Uh, let's see if I remember my lines. We're in rehearsals, remember everybody. I say something to the tune of, I got a song I'd like to sing. Of course, I don't want to hurt nobody, but there's someone out there that I knew a very long time ago, and I want to send this song out to him, to Coa Bays, somewhere out in California, I think. <laughs> Would been better for us. I get like would been better for us all if we never in this wild and wicked world and never met for the pleasure we both seem to get. Love, I'm sure that I never will forget. Oh, I'm thinking tonight of my new life. Who is sailing far over the sea? Oh, I'm thinking tonight of my blue eyes, and I wonder if he ever thinks of me. Oh, you told me once, dear, that you love me, and you said that we never would part. But a link in the chain has been broken. Leaves me with a sad making apart. Oh, I'm thinking tonight of my blue eyes, who is sailing far over the sea. Oh, I'm thinking tonight of him only, and I wonder if he ever thinks of me. What's that? You want to give your line? Oh gosh. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. <laughs> wouldn't you know it? And wouldn't you? That, that's that, actually, she, she does that line. What? Yeah. You? No, you do that line. Do I know that line? Yeah. These are scenes we just started staging. Go ahead. Come out to barter and You're see the done. full play. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you know it, Coy Bates was listening that night, California. In a week, he was in Texas. Within two that weeks, right. Coy and my Sarah life. were married. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coy, Coy did hear that song. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, why, don't, why don't we take some questions? Do you all have any questions or thoughts? Or maybe you have your own stories that are only the Carter family. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, so you, you wanna... I bet the mic said it. Here on Zoom. Do you have a question or that mic for you? And it's not really a question. Were you in the cast? And I'm trying to remember when, when Kim was playing Jeanette. I was, yeah. And Kim was my wife's, my wife and Kim toured together for years. And we went down to see the show at Carter Fold. And we took Nancy's mother. Now, these are folks whose families have been in Southwest Virginia for 300 years. They're one of the original families. Wow. And Jeanette was sitting there, and I think this was still the bus seats, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. And Jeanette was sitting there, and Rick Rose sat my mother-in-law right next to Jeanette. Mm -hmm. Now, my mother-in-law was about 94 years old at the time. Her husband 
had been playing along, we live out in, in Wise County, along Pine Mountain and Stone Mountain at the same time. I play his fiddle now. Within, I don't think it was three or four minutes, those two old Appalachian broads were just yapping and telling <laughs> stories to each other. And here I am, Nancy found me out in Montana. And I can honestly say this, that formed a connection with me that I made a commitment on their graves up behind the church that I would do what I do. And that's what brought me a long ways. And Brandy was, was there because we worked together in the Crooked Road. There are so many tentacles that came out of this play where people, we were trying to convince Appalachians of their own worth. Mm. And nobody had ever taken the time to really tell that story and how people started to feel like their worth in this region was something they could be proud of. And it was, I mean, it's, it's only one small part of it. We have no illusions. But the fact of the matter is, that play, Doug, when you wrote it, and as an alumni of the Barter, um, it was the start of a series of connections of the other plays that were written and, and produced by the Barter that started to honestly tell the story. This didn't exist. Mm. You know, this dream didn't exist yet. You know, it's interesting. One, one thing that I, I think about during this um, this time through, Bill, uh, which I've never thought about, I've, I've been associated with this play for 20 years, yeah. um, is that, so in 1927, AP and his family go to Bristol and and and, and the Big Bang and country music happens in Bristol. At the same time, in the Depression, in 1933, a man came back home from New York City and opened up a theater where people could trade produce to see theater. There, these two, they were contemporaries. Yeah. This is not, and, and so I, I was saying to you, Gene, it's mm -hmm. amazing to me that you have these two people, all book dreamers, right? And, mm -hmm. and have had lasting impact that still affect our region today. Um, and, and, they, and they were, yeah, I, I, I had never thought about that before. And the energy that they created the energy that they created, you don't want to get me started because I don't know about this. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, the energy, you can see it going on right now. After, I mean, I was down in the coal fields when the coal fields died. And all of a sudden, we're cool. I mean, people are looking at the authenticity of these messages, the simple, common, things that people feel and talk about are echoed in all of this music. But it's also the creativity of these mountains is something, I mean, Aaron Copeland writes about it in Appalachian Spring mm -hmm. in his music, to have it being done again. And I hope it's done long into the future whenever a new cast can be found, whatever. Uh, Eugene don't have to stay an awful lot healthy. I'm his understudy. Let me just say at this point that um, Keep on the Sunny Side is currently being done in Richmond at a theater in Richmond called Swift Creek Mill Theater. And my wife and I uh, and son and daughter-in-law went to see it this weekend. And it's a very good production. So if you have any friends or family in the Richmond area, uh, I think if you recommend it to them, they go see it. I think I'm pretty sure they will like it. Um, you know, they they are very enthusiastic about it. Um, they did it back in 2011. They're doing it this year. It's the same director, same AP, same Sarah, same Maybell as they did previously. And uh, like I said, they're having a lot of fun with it. They're eat up with it, and they have, <laughs> and they have named the theater Cat Coy. Base. Oh, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, no one's Eugene. But at the same time, I mean, it is a good production.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, most people have never seen you, so they don't know what they're doing. I would just like to make a comment. Um, as somebody just listening to y'all yet from around here, uh -huh. um, <laughs> as I have instead of seeing that coast region, who has always lived in two cultures. And I feel it often happens that it takes someone who is a little bit from outside mm. to bring validity to the value of something that everybody around here just kind of takes for granted mm. because it's singing. Mm -hmm. No, this is this is valuable music. This is quality music. There are rhythms. There are notes. There are melodies. There are voices that have value. And I think sometimes it takes someone like you to bring that to the forefront. Well, what I'll... The public at large, with that little bit because of your wife, you have a foot in both worlds. But yeah. You bring, it, you bring it to attention in a way that isn't always valued by the people who grow up. Well, what I always say is in New England, the past is revered. Um, you know, you've got Lexington and Concord, Old Ironside, the Freedom Trail, the Old North Church, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, when I came down here, you know, I delved into the past. What's so great about the culture here compared to New England is that music is such a big part of the culture. So that's, you know, that's what really got me hooked. And of course, you know, my wife, uh, she's from a She's one of the, from one of them big Appalachian families. Her mother got married at age 13. Wow. She had eight kids, 25 grandchildren, 25 great-grandchildren, oh several great-great-grandchildren, a beautiful Appalachian lady. And uh, also they sing. They're a singing family. Uh, she and her daughters would sing. They sing uh, a cappella, a lot of harmony, Nice and slow, weaving in and out the melodies. I mean, just gorgeous. Now, when I first joined the family 28 years ago, it was their belief that anyone could learn to sing. <laughs> they don't say that. Yeah. 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 Anybody else have any questions? Any other, and Scotty, were there any Zoom questions? Over here. Okay, and I do have a question too. So I'll go to Right. Right. Listening to all this, you know, one, uh, I think music is a gateway to theater to the culture. Sure. The region. And I was sitting here kind of listening, thinking back. I remember when this first opened, how many people come to the border that are from around here? They had never been. Yeah. They didn't, you know, they thought theater is, is a different art form, something that. And they realized it's accessible. And likewise, a lot of people after coming to the play went to the quarter club and they grew up here, but had never been there to experience that firsthand. So it's not just for the people outside that are learning about this, but in some ways it, it helped to let people that are from here get more in touch with their culture and experience. That. Thank, thank you for mentioning that though, because that what you're talking about there was a I remember that as being a big turning point for us in our organization in terms of, and that, that we still talk about to this day, which is how do we get more people from our region to understand that this is their theater? Um, because of that kind of, that, that, um, that obstacle of theater seeming like it's, it's uh, maybe it's snooty or it's not for me, or it's, 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 it, you have to be, you have to dress fancy, you have to do all, but know that this, that this theater is was founded for, and it still belongs to the people of, of this region. And 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 this show and and some others like it that, that we've done um, really helps to, to to do that. And and I think our partnership with the with the Carter Fold and things like that has really helped that as, as mm -hmm. well. Thank you for, for mentioning that. I have one question. It's more we've talked a lot about the music and the sort of history and the content of the play, but I have a question based on something that you said, Doug, about choosing between the scene in Mexico and the scene in Louisville and mm -hmm. having to pick and choose which one. And I'm sure you had to do that a lot. Mm -hmm. And it was probably like having to pick between your favorite, who's your favorite child? <laughs> but was there any scene that you just couldn't find a way to pull into the play for whatever reasons that you really wish could have been part of it? 
Um, yeah, that is a good question. I mean, honestly, no. I mean, I think that the I, I, I think that in general, the way keep on the sunny side is now, and it, you know, it was a process. Uh, you know, we talked about getting uh, you know Sarah singing the coy on the radio. You know, in right at the last minute and had to do some writing. Well, you know, we had our little mini production in 2002. We had a stage two production. We had a Roanoke production. And, you know, at first, I mean, we were just all about it. You know, people were loving it. But when we went to Roanoke, the Roanoke paper slammed it. <laughs> and um, we came to realize that because we had put that part in about Sarah, you know, which basically almost ends the Carter family right there. Um, you know, we didn't really tie it up properly. And so I had to do some serious rewrites before we opened the season in 2003. And that's when we put the, that song in there where um, we start scene two with AP singing, It'll Aggravate Your Soul, and Sarah saying, I Never Will Marry, you know, kind of simultaneously, which works really well. And also, um, we, Rick Rose had said to me, um, you know, I'd love, I wish you could put that song Gold Watch and Chain in there. Mm -hmm. And um, I came to realize that when AP and Sarah uh, split up around 1933, they had to go and record that song in just a few months. So I figured, well, they must have had to rehearse it. So we have them sing it. But instead of Sarah singing the whole thing, we have AP sing, you know, the last two verses quite pointedly to her, you know, tell me why that you do not love me. Um, you know, a face that is false, but fair. And then, you know, and it, it's comic because, you know, as they're singing, Sarah's getting madder and madder and madder. And, you know, pretty soon the scene kind of breaks apart. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to add those things and strengthen the AP and Sarah story. And then also we did some changes before we did it in 2015 at Barter to try to strengthen the Jeanette story because we kind of just left Sarah hanging. You know, I mean, honestly, once she sings, you know, to, to Coy, you know, she's the bad guy. And I mean, I got hate letters, you know, addressed to, to Sarah. How could she do, you know? <laughs> um, but um, now we have, uh, and then, of course, Sarah comes back and sings at the fold at the end, so obviously there had to be a makeup. So now we actually have an arc of Jeanette's story improved, where at the beginning of the play at, at AP's funeral, there's a little distance between Jeanette and Sarah, and then Sarah comes to realize her mother's point of view, which Jill here, you know, explained so beautifully. Um, yeah, I mean, a, you know, we all love AP. Um, you know, he, he, we wouldn't be here talking if it wasn't for AP. But at the same time, you know, Sarah had a point of view too. And so I think that um, now I think, you know, it, it's complete. Let me I think, put it that way. I seem to remember like that. I don't remember a lot of different scenes that came in and out, but I do remember we, we changed songs, several we changed songs, songs yeah. lots of songs, because there's so many different ways that you can tell the story with the songs. And so we got to we got to do a bunch of different ones, which oh, yeah. uh, has been great. Yeah. Um, yeah, we need to do a concert of songs that used to be in the used to be. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, for me, what I always want is for the songs to sell the story as much as possible. Yeah. And so finally, I think now we have really found these songs. Of course, when you've got 250 songs to pick from, you know, th there's a lot of songs that potentially could be in it. Because, I mean, let's face it, Carter's has a lot of great songs. Hey, um, thank you guys so much for coming out and, and being a part of this event tonight. And um, I hope you'll come and see us at, at, uh, at, the, at the Gillum stage. We're playing April 22nd through May 20th. Uh, you can get tickets by calling the box office going online and, uh, and going to Barter Theater. And, uh, and I hope you'll come and tell your friends and bring your family. Oh, it's going to be fun. Fold. Oh, and also, you can come to the Carter Fold. Go to the Carter Fold website. There's a, we're going to be doing two performances up there. It's going to be really special. April, so. April 26th uh, in the evening at the Carter Fold. And the last, the absolute last show, May 21st on a Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock on the Carter Fold. 
And to get tickets to the Car of Gold, it's through the Barter Box Office. Yeah, if you go to the website, you'll see information all about it. Let's um, let's finish up with the song, guys. You guys can help us out with this. I won't sing. <laughs> <You> won't sing. <laughs> 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 tell you the very very first performance to keep on the sunny side the first mini production performance I was there with my wife and my son Austin who was 11 my son Tanner who was seven well Tanner he got on his seat and on my lap and on his seat he tried to talk to the people behind us he twisted he turned he asked me about a million times, is it over, is it over, is it over? <laughs> and then when it was over, people liked it. They rose to a standing ovation. Tanner stands up and looks at me and says, don't ever write a movie like that again. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight and for being part of this wonderful uh, collaboration between the Barter Theater and the Birthplace of Country Music Museum. It's been a thrill for us, so thank, thank you. you, guys. Um, for those who don't know, we've got a lot going on at the museum, so let me just tell you a little bit about it before you go as my captive audience, um, especially since we have Sarah and Maybell here, because we have just opened a wonderful new special exhibit called I've Endured Women in Old Time Music, which yeah. features, of course, those foundational women of old time music. Um, it is open. It is here through December 31st. It's a great opportunity to learn about other women who have been important to that history. And we will be doing a whole wide variety of programming that goes along with that over the next few months. So please keep on, like, on in touch with us via our website. Um, tomorrow night, we have Farm and Fun Time featuring Jocelyn and the Sweet Compression and Time Sawyer. There's five tickets left. So if you want to see that, that show, you still have time. But if you are not able to come with us, you can watch it live on Facebook. So please do that. Um, Saturday, April 22nd, from 2 to 5 p.m., we have our monthly Bluegrass Jam that's free and open to the public, both musicians and just listeners. Um, and it's a great place to just hear good music. Tuesday, April 25th at 6.30 p.m., we have our very first Women in Old Time Music program, which is the screening of Songcatcher, which is a fictionalized account of a female songcatcher in the Appalachian Mountains doing what AP did, um, is finding those old songs. 
Um, Friday, April 5th at 10.30 a.m., we have our museum story time, which features my great aunt Arizona and music with Mama Molasses for tiny tots and their grown-ups. Mm-hmm. And then finally, please don't forget, remember the dates, April 22nd to May 20th at the Barter. And then, like they said, other dates at the Carter Fold. So be sure and get your tickets now. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you.